and the technical aspect. We'll go on to the next case. This is a one day old, 2.5 kilogram male, 37 uh, weeker, uh, who is born with esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. No respiratory distress, abdomen is not distended. They do have an extra thumb. Here's our chest x-ray with a tube in the upper pouch. Your very next step recommendation is for workup. Echo and all. Well, you can't do all as the very next step. <laughs> In this case, workup is negative. Do you go to the OR for, with bronchoscopy, OR with bronchoscopy, and try to pass a Fogarty or something else? OR for thoracoscopy, OR for thoracotomy, other. I ask a question like this every two or three years to see how this is all evolving. All right. So most are going to do D, O, R for th and thoracotomy, uh, and then 15% O, R and thoracoscopy. All right. Any comments, discussion around this? Steve, comments? How do you, how do, you do it? So I, I go to the OR and I do a thoracoscopy. I do not bronch all these kids, and we can have this discussion. There are benefits to bronching them, but the truth is with a type C, the incidence of a second fistula is almost non-existent. Well, why do I have it all the time? You're, uh, <laughs> so my biggest concern is anesthesia and getting them control the airway, and I think you can mess around. I don't like people like to go in and put in Fogarty's and get control and know where the fistula is, but you know, you see where the fistula is thoracoscopically quite well. So my goal is to get control of the fistula as soon as possible, and that's why we do it. If it's a pure atresia, I always bronch them, because I think the incidence probably is close to 20% of an upper pouch fistula. I, you know, I, I must admit that 20 years after doing the first thoracoscopic TEF, it's disconcerting that 15% of these cases, less than 15%. We didn't all follow Chuck either, right. so, you know. So, but, you know, that's how we do it. Howard? All right. Please. I, I, I was just curious uh, how many people would be willing to accept prenatal echocardiography results before going to the OR versus requiring a postnatal echo? Who would uh, uh, accept prenatal uh, echo? A couple of hands? It should be, yeah. I mean, the data's pretty impressive that it's, don't need a second echo. Any other comments on technique? Any of the open thoracotomy advocates want to ex explain why they don't like thoracoscopy or think that's not good? Someone? There are 40% 40, 40 of you out there. All right. Just real simple again, ask the question a different way sort of, but uh, just, make, just focusing on these things and not bronchoscopy and other stuff. You can have the counter. There you, there you have it, Steve. All right, very interesting. In this case, bronchoscopy and then thoracoscopy, there was no upper pouch fistula because I seem to have them all the time, Steve. So do. How do you ligate the fistula? It's just, we've been arguing about this for a long time, Steve. Plastic clip, metal clip, suture ligation, or something else. Suture closure or something else. All right, plastic clip, metal clip, and then we go suture ligation, suture closure, and other. Um, let's see, how many of you who do thoracoscopic repair do suture closure? Where you handle it just like the open technique? There you go. One. Oh, two. All right. 
I'm going to go back a slide just because I've... Uh, maybe not. Steve, I, in the bottom right, I was wondering if we could use the ligature to ligate the fistula. Okay, no. <laughs> Would you leave a transanastomotic tube? This has been up, down. The tube helps stents open. No, it causes a stricture. No, it causes leak. But you can feed early. Go ahead and the counter, yep. So while this is running, I just, I want to ask a question to those who do thoracotomy. Uh, if you do thoracotomy, do any of you believe that actually thoracoscopy would potentially be better, but you just don't have the skill set? Raise your hand if you're in that group that you would do. So that's impressive. So we're saying the other operation may be better, but we just don't have the skill set, which is very common in this particular operation. The question is, how are we going to move the needle on that? So how do we get centers Peter? trained to the point where they feel very comfortable? Peter, have a comment? Because that's, that's... Peter seems to I was know. just really interested that 68% of the people are doing thoracoscopic because the Midwest Pediatric Surgical Group, when they looked at their group... Thoracotomy. Oh, did I misread it? 30% only had 8% of the people. And I think I'm in a large group that we think this is a, a hard operation and we get one shot at it and we want to do it right. And at least for me, <laughs> and I want to do what's best for the kid. I'm willing to learn, but... But you that's know. the question. So because everyone, a lot of, not everyone, a lot of people just said that potentially there is a procedure out there that we think may be better, but we just don't have the skill set. This is a problem we need to tackle because this shouldn't be the case, right? We, should got, we have to figure out how to, how to get that into every center, and I don't have the answer. Well, I think we gotta, we can prove, gotta prove that it's potentially better, uh, but I, I wonder if there's a lot of people who are taking a risk, uh, or at least uh, there, there has to be a way of training people. All right, can we put back up the results again for the transanastomotic tube? And well, I'll raise, excuse me, I'll raise a question on controversy more. How many people, besides a scar, What's the advantage of thoracoscopy over thoracotomy? Obviously the scar, but what are the true advantages? Steve? <laughs> I going to say chest wall so, so there are multiple studies that show that there's a higher incidence of scoliosis, shoulder girdle weakness, and chest wall deformity. And I could show you 100 pictures. So to deny that is, is really fantasy. There are good documented studies. Ben O'Reilly, Ben O, where are you? You in here? Benno, you did the study, right? What's the incidence? Almost 40% in, in certain. Here. We have a handy German with us today. Uh, Benno Urahan of Germany. We did this study. The incidence was about 10%, but they were all grade one because the follow-up was short. Right. It was below two years. But with time, we can expect that they are considerably higher. So incidence. we're we're our motto is, Saving, saving lives, right? Differentiating lives, and yet we're ignoring the fact that a thoracotomy has potential significant morbidity in a large percentage of these children. So that is why. It's not a scar. Although if you, tell, if you ask parents, and you show a parent who's had a thoracoscopic or TEF or thoracoscopic lobe, and you look at their chest and you see three little tiny quarter-inch incisions, and you see someone who has a big scar, it makes a big difference to them makes a big difference to the kids. But it's the morbidity of the incision. And as long as we continue to ignore a relatively high potential morbidity of that incision, then it's an issue. Real quick, I, I feel like I go ahead and we go back up. Well, <laughs> two, I, two quick comments here. I'm just gonna make a quick comment about the MSK issue again. I think those studies were for classic thoracotomies where there was significant muscle division, division of stratus anterior, very aggressive thoracotomies, most of them done a long time ago. The current thoracotomies that we do with muscle sparing are not the same type of thoracotomy. We're looking. Emil, I'll we, show we, you we've, the pictures. We've, we've, published our, we've published our data on esophageal atresia looking up to 12 years out. We're now looking at patients 20 years out, okay, adults who've had this, and we're going to publish those results soon. The MSK um, morbidity is minor, really minor. OK, 
that real quick? How yeah. many how many open lap how many open call cystectomies do you do? The lap coli is an easy operation. The thoracoscopic. The, the incidence of bile duct injury operation. is still much higher. The problem higher is, you know, we had, lap coli. If I had we had a this conference a few right years now. ago, you two guys sit down. and the mother got up and said, oh, down, My surgeon down. was under a lot of pressure, and I wish he was not. Emil, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the comments. We've got to go ahead. I was going to move to something we have data on, and um, this is a trans and asthmatic tube. Data? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so with the consortium, um, we published data that show that trans asthmatic tubes are associated with a much higher rate of stricture formation. And then that was um, shown also by Marcus Malik in the Pittsburgh series, retrospectively also, showing an extremely high rate of strictures with trans asthmatic tubes. There's also a recent meta-analysis that also showed increased strictures with trans asthmatic tubes. So now the, the criticism is it's all retrospective data. But we just completed a prospective trial within the consortium, and it finished in January. We have to wait a year to follow up our patients, but we'll finally have that question answered. Thank you very much. Kathy? Well, I just want to say that if we're looking at advanced surgical skill, we have to swallow our pride and say that it's okay to say we don't have those skills, but then to seek out opportunities to gain those skills. Simulation-based education, you all know that I'm big into simulation, I'm big into skills acquisition, but it works. It takes high risk, rare operations, and it puts them in the lab where we gain our skills, and that's appropriate. The data show that we, as a group, do one TEF a year on average, one. And whether you do it thoracoscopically or whether you do it open, one a year is not enough to maintain your skill set. I don't care who you are, I don't care where you trained, one is not sufficient. So we need to be able to swallow our pride and say that there are opportunities for us to gain those skills, to maintain those skills once we gain them in fellowship, or begin to gain them in fellowship, and to seek those opportunities where they exist, because they do exist. There are great opportunities to do so. Now I will say I am biased because I do own a patent on models, so take me with a grain of salt, because I do admit that I have a disclosure. Thank you for that conflict of interest statement at the end. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Don, um, Andreas Meyer, uh, SUNY Upstate. I want to thank Dr. Lal and his group. Uh, we put trans uh, anastomotic tubes in on every one. We don't do that anymore, and I think the data are clear that you shouldn't. All right, we've got five minutes, so let's try to keep going. In this case, bronchoscopy and thoracoscopic ligation with anastomosis. The gap was two centimeters, and a five-inch feeding tube was passed and a chest tube was placed, um, started on feeds through the NG. Would you, on post-op day one, would you feed through the MG if you put it in, by mistake? Uh, keep NPO <laughs> or try for transduodenal tube feeding? Let's quick, go quickly if we can. Start feeds, keep in PO, okay. Post-op esophagram, none, three, five, seven, somewhere in that range after that. Post-op day seven, all right. Post-op day five, and uh, anybody in the 8% none quickly stand up and make a comment since, please. So uh, one of my partners, Hal Lay, did a little study on this. It's unpublished right now, but all of the, uh, all of the, he looked at all the esophagrams we had done, and the ones with leaks, they all had clinical signs. So the bottom line is you don't need the esophagram if you're looking for leak. So in other words, you get sick if you have a problem, you don't need to see it on the software. Uh, yes, I would like to make a similar comments. I don't uh, do a contrast study following esophageal trees repair, both thoracoscopic open, and I've been doing this for many years. And actually, the, the results of the series from uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital, where I was working before, is supporting this concept. We didn't have a major clinical leak by doing that. Obviously, we could uh, not see the non-clinical leaks, 
but in terms of structure rate or other things, the results were, were supporting the fact of not doing a contrast study. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, one quick comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Over here. Sorry, I didn't see you. Thanks. W without a contrast study, when, uh, when would you start feeds? Chuck? Piero, when would you start feeds? Oh, wait, I, guess I start know. giving feeds on postability day two. Two. And uh, I could also go orally if there is no uh, tension on the anastomosis. There is a lot of saliva that goes through the esophagus uh, independently of the feeds. Thanks. Yeah, I totally agree. This is the way to do it is avoid esophagram because what you'll see, if it's a big leak, you're going to know, right? If it's something contained leak, you can feed through that. There's no problem with that. So this well, could avoid a, a lot of radiation. There's a big difference between 92% and 8. Tom? Yeah, so uh, at the risk of uh, having my crazy moment like Crummel did this morning, I, I just want to bring up, uh, so Marjaka pointed out the, the concern for advanced failure that's going up and up and up. And as I'm listening to this, I'm so grateful that you've done this because one of the things that I think the board members who are here, are all board members who've been through the board, can see how much variability without any correct answers. And to hear um, that great data is evolving, and yet we thought that when we did the last iteration of the boards, we were putting together subject matter experts and delivering an exam by subject matter experts. And, and that's one of the things that we need to realize is that when we come out of training, uh, there's a lot of difference that's across that may not be measured in failure or certification. So uh, sessions like this are really important to elicit the variation that goes on, uh, not only in our practices, but in our training. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Basim Khalil from Sidra Medicine in Qatar. Uh, I actually come from the United Kingdom, and 20 years ago, Britain decided that, exactly as the, one of the speakers said, if you do one case of osophageal atresia a year, that's not enough, no matter where you train and no matter who you are. So the UK decided that at consultant level, we will have to subspecialize into upper GI and lower GI, so that you have one group of surgeons in any center doing the osophageal atresias so that they don't dilute the cases. The results from the UK found out that the results in these situations are much better. Uh, I'm just asking why is the United States still not subspecializing? Who's gonna answer that? I will. I'll answer that. So we looked, at that, we looked at volume and outcomes in the consortium. And um, in the Midwest Consortium, volume of data per surgeon did not have any, out, um, any correlation with complication rates. Great. Max, should we stop? Yep. So thanks, everybody, Thank you, everybody. for your participation. Rachel.